I'm so glad to see everyone here this morning. Now I can put it on the internet, it was almost standing room only at Biblical Life. <laughs> Chuck said, I had to come early just to get a seat. <laughs> we have been dealing the last three weeks with established, being established in truth. And I think as everybody kind of expected, I would get into hermeneutical principles uh, as we got into this and thinking I was going to reveal kind of the secret sauce that we as ministers discover when we go through Bible college and seminary. But one of the things I have discovered is that you can have two different people all trained in hermeneutical process and they can exegete the scriptures and they can sit there and look at the same scriptures and get completely two different things. That's always been a quandary to me. Especially with some of the things I'm hearing coming from pulpits today. Have you turned on Christian television and you sat there and looked at it and say, what on earth did you smoke this morning before you got up there and you started preaching? And so we have been been looking at some things to be established in truth. And I want to do a quick review. One of the things we discovered in Ephesians 4.16, the very first piece of your armor is truth. And guys, if you don't stand in truth, you can't put on the armor. There's a reason I think every one of those were succinctly put into place in the order that they must be put onto your lives. And if you don't start with truth, you end up in the battlefields of life in your BVDs. And how many know that is not a good place to be when you're fighting an enemy that has your name? And I have discovered that a lot of the times why Christians are constantly so beat up is they don't have their armor on because it's not me just getting up in the morning and say, Lord, I put on, I gird my loins with truth and I do this, that, and the other. You do it by what you do in your day out and day in lives. That as I discover truth and begin to walk in it, I'm building the armor in my life. And how many know that's important? Because when you have something established in your life, you can take that truth and you can push back the enemy with it. So we got to have it as a part of our spiritual armor. Secondly, we discovered in Ephesians that we are in a wrestling match with dark powers that continually look for places to take advantage and to throw us off balance. And the Apostle Paul, he could have used, you know, a standoff or maybe used a, a term that's, you know, sword to sword combat. But he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And if you have ever been wrestling... They're sitting there sizing each other up, looking for a place to take advantage to throw you off balance. Have you ever had the enemy throw you off balance? And the reason he was able to throw you off balance many times was because that truth in your life was not established the way that it should. It got you to doubt, it got you to compromise, and got you off. We also discovered that there are two sources of knowledge the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both trees have fruit and both trees have seed. The Bible says that we we have received the engrafted seed. We've received that good seed that we heard the gospel. It was planted in our hearts and when it sprang up, it led to salvation. But how many know the enemy also has seed? And it fills our public school systems, it fills our universities, it fills the evening news, it fills fills politics, and they're constantly trying to sow bad seed, and this is the only place you can get good seed. And how many know right now the good seed is under attack in the United States of America today? You're considered backwards and old-fashioned, and they try to use reason, the age of reason, and if it's not reasonable... Well, I don't know. I've studied evolution. It's not reasonable. In fact, it is so not reasonable that now they've had to come up with panspermia that aliens dropped by and seeded us. And then you figure out, well, who made those aliens? Well, somebody dropped by their planet and somebody dropped by the planet after that. Well, you got to go back somewhere for it to all make sense. And you find out there has to be a God or none of it works. But there's seed. And you got to be careful what seed you allow into your life and what fruit that you're eating of. We've also found out that all knowledge has a spiritual component to it. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is empowered by Lucifer. The seed of God's word is empowered by God. And if you, if you don't understand the spiritual concept of knowledge, and how many know information is different than knowledge? 
You can have all the facts and miss the point. Knowledge is, is either breathed by the Spirit of God or is breathed by the Spirit that is behind the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there are spiritual forces behind it. Information is different than knowledge. Knowledge is different than understanding. I've known people that knew a lot but never had any understanding. I've been there a few times in my life. In the military, we used to call them intel, uh, educated beyond their intellect. But the, you, you knew a lot of facts. You just didn't have any understanding about that knowledge that you had. And finally, you can grow up into wisdom. Wisdom, Brother Chuck and Brother Jeff, is not just knowing what to do. It's also knowing what not to do because you weigh the prices up and say, I'll not do that because that's too costly. We call that sanctification. There comes a time in your life that you've grown so much in God that that little sin is too costly for you. And you look at the devil and say, I don't think I'm going to have that because I know what comes with it. And I have invested too much in where I am to give it up. The word tells us that there is both the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, and both of them are constantly trying to mentor us. Before you came to Jesus, the only one that was tutoring you was the spirit of error. And how many know in our lives, he got us to accept a lot of things that were not truth? Not just about the word. How many know there's a lot of concepts about you, the devil taught you, that aren't right? And they keep you from experiencing God's best in your life. We have a lot of philosophies. We have a lot of ideas that did not come from God that are of this world. And, and uh, even, how many times, Brother Jeff, in counseling do we deal with folks that say, I just don't think, I, can, I, I just don't feel like I'm worthy. I don't feel this. I don't feel that. Uh, now, the Word of God says the opposite. But somewhere along the line, somebody did something to them that infected them with a seed that taught them they weren't worthy. They couldn't have. They didn't deserve and sometimes it's hard to get that thing up by the roots, isn't it? But the Spirit of God is here. Once you, once you get saved, you need to recognize, because even as a believer, guys, the spirit of error tries to creep in. He tries to get you mad at stuff. He tries to get you in the flesh. He tries to teach you all the wrong things. We need to start listening to the Spirit of God. I think one of the most powerful prayers you can pray every morning when you get up is, Spirit of truth, have your way in my life today. Make me blind to what the enemy's trying to teach me, and you teach me your truth. Because Jesus promised me you were going to lead me into all truth. We also discovered how man was made up last week, and I'm, I'm doing a lot of this review for all the good folks that came up from Great Harvest Church. It's kind of hard sometimes to me to feel like you step in the middle of a play. The, uh, the computers that we have, the PCs that you have, or the Macs that you have, were actually designed after the human mind. And the human mind has three components. It has, it has the conscious mind, which is like your computer screen. It has your subconscious mind, which is like, your, like the RAM in your computer. And how many know that you have limited RAM? And so when you don't deal with a lot of issues and you start clogging up all your RAM because it's, all, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not rectified with, next thing you know, you can't remember your name. Anybody ever been there? That's why daily we need to write things down. We need to bring things to the cross. We need to keep that RAM cleared out because you cannot open the back of your head and add more RAM. The unconscious mind is like a hard drive. And here's the beauty of, of how God created us. Every single thing that you have experienced or learned or felt emotion has been perfectly recorded in its entirety, all the way down to the smells, the feelings that you had, all the sensations that you had since you were in the womb. Since you were in the womb, it's all there. I remember one time we had one of our graduates that deals a lot with domestic violence. And, uh, and how many know God had, you know, usually you get called to that because you are that, and you have to get delivered of it. And when his little daughter was like six months old, she was throwing a fit and everything else, and, and he wasn't right with God in his life. And finally he says, Daddy don't like babies, and he'd give her, go give her to Mama, you know, because she was just so fussy, had colic or whatever. Years and years go by, and now he's a grandpa, and his daughter won't let him hold his new grandson. And tears start streaming down his face. What have I done? What, what, what wound have I done? And finally it came up out of her hard drive. Daddy don't like babies. 
How many of us have dealt with people that maybe the, the mother that was an unwanted pregnancy and that child comes out of the womb with a spirit of rejection on it? It's all there. But we've also discovered, and this is how sneaky the devil is, in your unconscious mind that you can only have access to at certain times is where all strongholds are. It's not always on the screen where you can see it. It's not in the RAM where you can process it. It's hidden. It's hidden. Also, everything on your hard drive is your perception filter. All the lies and everything that you've experienced during, during your entire lifetime help you perceive the reality that's going on right now. And if there's lies there, Brother Jeff, that's why one guy can read the Word and get one thing. One guy can read the Word and actually get what the Spirit of God is saying is because there's stuff embedded in the hard drive that is skewing the Word. You can, you can learn all the principles of understanding God's word, but if there's junk on your hard drive that's like a Trojan horse virus, it takes you off. And finally, last night we discovered the power of Psalms 119.71. This is one I had a hard time understanding. How I many know we, we would rather say, it was good for me that I was blessed that I might learn thy statutes? Wouldn't that be just a wonderful verse? Every time you get blessed, you can stop and say, man, I'm a learning something. <laughs> But here in Psalms 119, he said, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Oh, it was good for me that something went wrong. It was good for me that everything didn't go my way because what it did is it brought around the place of the hard drive where that stronghold was. And, and if that stronghold comes up into the ram, if it comes up to where I can see it, I can now plead the blood of Jesus into it. I can now say, I caught you. So sometimes having a bad day can be the best thing that ever happened to you because it will cause your strongholds to come up. You repent of whatever that thing was and you say, Lord, I don't believe that truth anymore. I choose to believe the word and you plead the blood of Jesus into it. That thing comes down and that demonic presence that was speaking to you has got to go. That's why it's a process of getting into truth. Now, I tell you what, I, I, I was back because I didn't realize this for years and so everything that stronghold came up, man, I just dug it deeper. It's like, whoo, I got a feeling and it ain't going to be good, you know. But now I can, I can follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. My spirit says, that's a stronghold. Bring that thing down. Get that thing cleansed out. Get it off your hard drive because you don't want it skewing the word. You don't want it messing with your relationships, messing with your marriage, messing with your finances, messing with all these things because that's how the devil works to bring you down. Now, finally, we can get to point one. That was just a review of what we've done the last three weeks. And if you guys want more of it, we do have the DVDs that are free on the table right over there. But I want to look back at truth and freedom. And this is out of John 8, 31 and 32. And almost everybody should know this one. Then Jesus said to those Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Don't you like that? But there's several things in reading this. Now, you were set free at salvation. How many believe that? But how many know you got a whole lot more freedom to experience after that? You finally got out of the cage. Now it's time to get everything the enemy's put in your pockets to hold you down. It's time to get the shackles off your feet. It's time to get the chains and the shackles off your hands. It's time to move forward. And Jesus begins to tell us several things about this. He said, he said, continue is mino in the Greek, and it means to remain or abide. It is something that is not an event. It's a process. In the hard times are chances to continue in his word. It's in the day in and day out activities of the life that I can either abide in his word or I can set it aside to deal with the issues the wrong way. Truth, aletheia, means in the Greek, and what I love about this, not only does it mean true or truth, it means in reality. You see, there's a lot of lies the enemy has told about, has sold you the goods on you. He sold goods to you, and you bought them. They're not true. And as, Je and as I become to continue in the word, and I become a disciple of Jesus, a disciple is someone who disciplines their life by the teachings of another. And that another better be Jesus if you're going to be his disciple. And so as I work out this process and the spirit of truth is working in me, his job is to bring the junk in me that is a lie so that I can discover what reality is. 
There was a story years and years ago about a woman who used to uh, serve the royal family in England. And she had since retired and fallen into hard times. And this reporter had found her living in a cardboard box, living on scraps in the hands out of other people. And, and he was kind of interviewing her, but she had one treasure that was the most precious thing to her, and it was a letter from the royal family. She couldn't read. She had just been a, a servant, a nanny and stuff, and I guess in all their dealings they hadn't discovered that she couldn't really read. And the reporter said, can I see this? And he began to read it, and the more he read it, the bigger his eyes got and the bigger his jaw dropped. And he said, "Hun, do you know what this letter says? And she says, well, it thanked me for all my years of service. No, no, no. It does more than that. It said from the day that you retire until the day that you die, every need would be paid for, that you would have housing, that you would have clothing, that you would have an income. From that day that you retired until the day that you die, the royal family was going to see to it that everything that you ever needed would be provided. You see, the, her reality was she had no money and she lived in a cardboard box. But the true reality was she was favored by a royal family and that everything that she ever needed would be taken care of because of her service to that family. And let me tell you something. The devil may have sold you a lie that you don't deserve anything. You don't deserve to be happy. You don't deserve to have a good marriage. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve that. But you know what? We're related to a king. We're related to a king that says, you know what? Let me give you reality. I want more for you than you want for yourself. I want more joy in your life than you could ever imagine. Oh, how many times in the word of God does God say, I want your joy to be full? I don't know about you, but sometimes I can't even hardly see it as a drop in the bucket. And God says, oh, the reality is I want your joy to be full. I've got to bring you to reality to fill the bucket. Guys, we've got to let him do it. We've got to let him do it. Truth and freedom is not an event or even a sprint. It's a marathon. How many, how many of us, now some of us are older, we have more gray up here. How many of, of us realize that the bad things in our life that we are in many times, it took us a long time to walk into it. You just didn't wake up one morning and say, Boy, this is really poopy. <laughs> you know, you walked into it, and, and sometimes the enemy actually convinced you to invest a lot to get there. Somebody didn't wake up one morning and are addicted on drugs and can't figure out how they got there. How I many know to be on drugs, it takes a big investment? Not only does it take an investment for them, they end up stealing from their mama, stealing from their grandmama, or anybody else that they can get their hands on to feed that thing. There was a great investment to it. And so sometimes it takes a while to walk out of it. And I, I, love, the, I love the simplicity of the gospel. If it was just on a certain day, a certain anointing with a certain speaker, and they could wave their hands and you'd be free forever, how many know that is not, you can't, you can't replicate that? And, and was sometimes in the charismatic movement, we get to where it's, you know, a certain preacher with a certain whammy, and there was a certain anointing, and they sang the songs just a certain way. Yeah. I've, even, I've even had them get up and take, and take uh, duct tape and make a big X on the floor and say, this is the spot. I mean, I, I can't get healed nowhere, right here. Now, I don't know about you, but that's hokey. But every one of us walked in to where we are, and if we can repent and listen to the Holy Ghost, every one of us can walk out. We can replicate it in any life that will yield to the Spirit of God, yield to the sovereignty of this Word, that this Word is true and every, everything else is a lie, and begin getting into that, and God can walk them right out, and they have something called a testimony, that they can, that they can see it rehearsed and redone in life after life after life. This is what the writer of Hebrews tells us. Wherefore, seeing that we are, are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. How many know that? How many every one of us have a different the sin? I love the King James because some of them missed that. They just call sin. No, every one of us have the sin. Some of us, it may be affecting our health because we can't pass up the donut or we can't pass up the, you know, oh, uh, Especially St. George's Donuts. 
I've seen many a Baptist preacher walk out of there speaking in tongues as they were munching on them, nom, 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 as they walked out of there. Or in my younger years, the reason that I am so such a well-rounded preacher is I have never met a bag of Doritos and a, or a keg of dip that was not one serving. <laughs> Every one of us have the sin that so easily besets us, but when I realize what Jesus has done in my life, I learn to lay it down as I begin to walk this life of, of discipleship with Christ, and the Holy Spirit is now tutoring me, and I begin throwing the junk the enemy put in my pockets to hold me down. I begin emptying my pockets, throwing those things aside. And let us run the race with impatience so that we can get to the end. No. Run the race with patience that is set before looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, endured, endured. You see, a sprinter doesn't have to endure much, like four minutes, three minutes. There's something, when I found in the military, when, when they make you run two miles PT, there's something called endurance you have to have. And some of those guys will run 10 miles every morning. You have to have endurance to do that. Let me tell you something. To get out of the mesh you're in, sometimes it takes endurance to get there. It takes endurance. And, and there, there comes a place where you're out of the mess, but you're not into the best. And it takes endurance to get there. You've got to be willing to change and let the Holy Spirit mentor you and become established in truth in your life as he's teaching you. And you realize that through the endurance, I move up to a new level in God. We call it next level living. And what I have found out, no matter how wonderful the next level is, there's always another level in God. From faith to faith and glory to glory, line upon line, precept upon precept, God wants to continually take us up. I remember in, the, in the, uh, the life of John G. Lake that he was fellowshipping with his first wife that went on to be with the Lord, and there was some questions kind of uh, about it because he had such a powerful healing ministry. And in the midst of her sickness that he was believing God to heal, she got so close to heaven, she said, I don't want to stay. She went up to such a level, there was no way to go back down. And she said, listen, I've got a glimpse of this. My job's done. Don't you try to resurrect me now. I, I, I went up to the top shelf level, and I'm not, I'm not going back downstairs. And see, that's the way it should be, that every year we get closer to God, closer to God, closer to God. Sickness and disease should not take you out. You just get so full of heaven, the earth can't hold you anymore. It's the way it should be for the saints of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, that for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same, and sat down on the right hand of uh, the right hand of the throne of God. Can I give you a clue what gave Jesus the ability to endure the cross? You want to know the secret? He saw you. He saw you. He said, I can suffer this to get you free. I can suffer this to forever change your life, to bring you into my Father's house. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. And how many of us have met believers that have fainted in their minds? They liked events. Guys, quit being event oriented, it's a journey. God didn't go to Abraham and say, come on, boy, let's have a meeting. He said, come walk with me. Meetings are good. They're refilling stations along the journey, but don't camp out and refuse to, to you know, you may, some churches are the, uh, some services are the best 7-Eleven that you'll ever see. I mean, they have everything from Holy Ghost Slurpees to hoagies that are just wonderful, and you gas up your tank, and you just want to camp there, but how many know that after that, I've got to make the journey to the next time to refill? and I grow in God. Now there's those that did not have endurance in the word of God. In 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 19, this charge I commit unto thee, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before, uh, but, that went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have been made shipwreck. Now let, let's put this back in perspective. Timothy was called to ministry, and he had some prophetic truths spoken over him that made a live part of this word. 
And he said, the, the word that the Holy Spirit has made alive to you are tools in your hands to fight with in your spiritual warfare. When you really find out who you are, are you going to believe the lies of the enemy of who you're not? You start making progress when the devil comes to you and says, well, won't you do this? No, Mike Lake doesn't act like that anymore. That Mike Lake is dead. The new Mike Lake doesn't do that. The new Mike Lake is a new creature, and he refuses to respond like that. You see, you're holding on to faith. You're holding on because what the devil, the warfare is to get you to let go. If you refuse to let go, you cannot be denied victory. Let that sink in this morning. If you refuse to let go, the devil can't hold back the victory. But some have let go. And what happened? They were made shipwrecked. Let's go on a little bit further. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. And brethren, could, uh, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with the milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are you able to bear it, or now able to bear it. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For some would say, for one, for while one saith, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Well, I, I follow Mike Lake, well, I follow Jeff Hamm, well, I follow Dr. Looper, well, I follow Perry Stone. Do you know why we get into that? The different ministries have different anointings for different things. The Apostle Paul came and said, you know, I've, I've just given you milk right now because I'm trying to grow you up. Apollos came, you know, Apollo came through, and he would give him a little, about, a little bit of meat. No, I don't want that. I want to hear about the blessings. I don't want to hear about the responsibilities. I don't want to hear about dealing with bad feelings. I don't want to hear about having to crucify stuff. And so I'm just of what Paul's giving out right now. Well, I tell you what now, I'm of this guy because he's really giving out the deep stuff. Have you ever heard that? You know what? The deep stuff, if you can't handle a warm milk, <laughs> the deep stuff will choke you out and you'll end up out so far in the left field that even angels can't find you. And we, we have seen that in the Pentecostal movement. We've seen that in the charismatic movement. We have seen that in the Hebraic roots movement that they started getting into Kabbalah and all this crazy stuff. And they don't even have a foundation of who they are in Christ or anything else. And the next thing you know, they're, they're out there lost and floating out in space orbiting with satellites. You think, where on earth did you end up there? You didn't have any endurance in the truth. Hebrews 8, or 5, 8 through 14 says, Though he were a son, yet yielded, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, this is talking about Jesus. Jesus learned obedience by the things that he had suffered. It's the hard times. You learn the true power of God when you're facing Goliath, and God tells you to take the rock out of your pocket and sling it at him when you want to run with everything that you have. You just know there is a hole someplace with your name on it, and your favorite Twinkies and desserts and everything are sitting in that hole waiting on you, and God says, no, I want you to run at the problem, not away from the problem. In that time of trial in obedience, you learn something. You learn the power of God. And being made perfect, he became the author of, of eternal salvation unto, the, unto them that believe in him. No. To them that confess him. No. Them that obey him. Them that obey him. Called of God as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time that ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as, as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, those who by reason of use, underline that in your Bible, reason of use, not reason of confession, not reason of hoping, 
but reason of use. You want to get into the deep things of God, start doing what you know to do when there's opposition. Start doing what you know is right when your flesh doesn't want to do it. Start doing what the Word says when everything in you and everything around you and even your own family says don't do it and you choose to do what God says, it will mature you. For reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern, discern both good and evil. Now this is really... A conundrum for me, because how many have always said, you know, we got to fight the flesh, man. we got to fight the flesh. we got to fight the flesh. You can come to a place in God you have so trained the flesh that it knows to do the right thing. Oh, Mike, I don't believe that's possible. I was in the military. And during basic training, we took apart our M16s. We put them back together. We took apart our M16s. We put them back together. We took apart our M16s. We put them back together. Now, that was over 30 years ago. You could set an M16 and completely strip it down, and I could have it back together within seconds. Why? Because it becomes a body memory. Some of you have driven so much, or the same route home, every night, every night, every night. Have you ever spaced out and you found out you were home? Your head wasn't driving you home. Your flesh drove you home. And this luckily, a cow didn't interrupt the, the normal thing of walking out there. And I know about that in Pocahontas, Arkansas, because last time I had two cows come right out and greet me in the road. That's a little rough when you're going 45, 50 miles an hour. It's like, hello, cow. But your body learns it. And what we've not realized is your body had learned sin before you got saved. And it does it without thinking. It just does it because that's the most natural thing to do. When you do the word, 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 the devil really gets in trouble when your flesh starts wanting to do the word. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to pray it through. You just do it. Deuteronomy 5.27 and this, this is what the people of God said to Moses. Now, this is echoed all throughout the Torah. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. Speak thou unto us all that the Lord God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and we will do it. We will hear it and we will do it. And that is over and over again in the Torah. We will hear and we will do. We will hear and we will do. Now, sometimes in the King James Bible or the English Bible, we don't get it. There are several places in this, in the Hebrew, it's reversed. In the Hebrew, it says we will do, we will, we will do and then we will hear. We will do and we will hear. And the rabbis have always pondered that and says, how can we do something before we hear it? We, the, 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 the modus operandi in the kingdom is you hear and you do. And then finally, one rabbi, the light came on. Oh, sometimes with the things of God, you can never really hear it until you're on the other side of experience. How many of us have situations in our life that we saw absolutely no way out? No way out. And God says, do this. And we think, God, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard in my life. God says, trust me, do it. And you do it, and all of a sudden things start falling into place, and this light comes on, and finally you hear what God was saying. There, there is a power that comes from hearing God that will change your life forever. There's some people that get so entrenched in healing, sickness can no longer stay in their bodies. They finally heard, and some of our aggravation is we kind of hear, but we've not really heard. The light has not fully come on, and so we battle with sickness, and we push through and try to get healing, and sometimes we're, we're in a mess because sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't come. The difference is in the hearing, that if I hear it fully from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, and it, it saturates the screen, the RAM, and the hard drive, and the hard drive has no sickness and disease on it, sickness and disease has a hard time to stick. But sometimes it's a hard road to go. Guys, the truth of God is more than just facts. I can give you facts all day long about how you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. But until you hear it, until it goes from facts to knowledge and the Holy Ghost breathes life into it. Just the same way you got saved. How many heard the gospel message a thousand times before you actually got saved? Some of us 10,000. We were really honorary. Okay slow learners. 
We got to hear it here. Maturity comes from abiding in truth, actively moving in truth, whether you feel like it or not. Only through repeated obedience to God's word can you hear what he is saying to us. The constant doing grows us into the place we can hear. Constant doing grows you. Do you know there are levels of God's word that you can't, you're not ready to hear right now because God's got to grow you into a place to walk in it? Remember the story of Abraham? God says, now listen, I'm El Shaddai. Anybody messes with you, I'm going to open up a can of whoop pagan, okay? But yet he trembled before Pharaoh. Lied. This is my sister. My other brother, Daryl, you know. He did that at the beginning because even though he heard it, he didn't hear it, and God had to mature him to the place. Then later on in his life, as he's matured in God, he found that Sodom and Gomorrah, four kings that went in and taken Sodom and Gomorrah and took his family. He didn't care about Sodom and Gomorrah. Found out Lot, his cousin, was taken. He sat in there in the evening, he says, Round up the boys. We're going to go take them kings down and get our stuff back. How many know that's a different man? That man knew El Shaddai not only meant the God who meets our every need. El Shaddai in the Hebrew can also mean the destroyer. He says, I'm going to go down there, and when I go down there, I'm in covenant with the one who could whip the world with one pinky, and I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to get my kinfolk back, and I'm not going to stutter about it. I'm not going to say, she's my sister. I'm going to go down and say, you let go of my stuff. I serve Yahweh Elohim, and he will bring you to his, your knees before me because I walk with him. That's maturity. He grew up. And we need to yield to the Holy Spirit because there's some things going on in your life. God's trying to get you to a level of maturity to see the depths of what he's trying to show you so that you can walk in it. But you got to yield. What, how many of us have had stuff happen in our life because we did the stupid thing over and over and over again until stupid happened? Why do you think it's going to make any difference that if I start doing God's word, if I do it a hundred times and on the hundred and first time a miracle happens, I finally heard it. That's the way the kingdom operates. That's, that's how I get established in truth is the Holy Spirit is tutoring me and mentoring me. He's giving me the seed of the word and as it grows up under his nourishment, it gets to the place where I have the fruit of victory in my life because I obeyed over and over and over again until I finally heard it. I'm going to end with this. You know, there was a time in my, in my marriage that uh, she just didn't see the logic of tithing. That's, that's grocery money. What are you doing, boy? <laughs> Come on. And it, it's, it's kind of a struggle to get the tithe. But one day, the light came on. Man, when she got it, she, she is a bulldog now when it comes to tithing. And she makes sure that she, and, and you know, sometimes, you know, things, things go thick and things go thin in ministry sometimes. And so sometimes you get some tithe accrued. <laughs> and so when, when things get to be a little bit thicker, the first thing that comes off the top is we're getting all the tithe paid. And I mean down to the penny. Because she says, when I do that, then my faith can soar. Because she has learned. And that causes miracles to happen because she has matured to that place. And many of us, we may have a hard time believing God, but if you just do it and just trust him and you learn from experience and you see the word beginning to go in operation, you start getting established in truth. And that's what the word, that's what the Holy Spirit wants more than anything else for our generation. We have lost our way. We have lost truth. And we're sliding down a dark hill backwards and somebody has greased the road. That's the way America is going right now. Yeah. And it's time for the remnant to raise up and say, God is establishing me in truth. And all of a sudden, people can see you put on the brakes and start going the other way. They're going to start saying, how do you do that? What's going on? What makes, what makes you so special, Brother Ed? That you can believe God, and God will just do it. I go to first church. I tip God every once in a while. 
I even put up with my pastor even when he gets to preaching hard and don't run him out of church. How come it works for you and not me? And you say, well, first of all, you need to change your attitude. <laughs> and you need to start learning what I've learned because God's word works. It works, but God's going to have to grow you up to the place you can walk in it. And God, God may have to walk you through some stuff to get to some stuff. But that's part of the kingdom. That's how we get established in truth. And without that, you can know all the hermeneutical processes in the world. You can have every lexicon known to man. You can have all these things and miss the entire point. Because you're not in the Holy Ghost school of hard knocks. Because he's got to knock the dents out to get you where you need to go. Oh, Father God, we just thank you this morning. Father, we thank you that you so loved us that you put up with us. <laughs> That you put up with our honoriness, you put up with our misunderstanding, you put up with us trying to get us to acknowledge truth so that we can walk in truth. And Holy Spirit, what we do as a people this morning, number one, we want to thank you for your patience. Holy Spirit, thank you. When we didn't want to listen to you and you kept on bringing us back to truth, thank you this morning. We thank you for it. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and just absolutely embed your truth into every single area of our lives. Father, we throw open every room. We throw open every chamber within our being. And Father, we say, come, cleanse, restore, and establish your truth. We enter into to be disciples of Jesus, and we enter into the Holy, school, the Holy Ghost school of hard knocks, that through life that we're going to learn the power of and the majesty of both the name of Jesus and the power of his word. And Father, we just thank you. We praise you for it this morning in Jesus' name. 